So tonight we are going to conclude a four-week series on fasting. It's based on the Converge Bible study that was written by Ashley Alley. And, and before we begin, it might be helpful for us to review uh, where we've been. And for those of you who might be joining us for the first time in this series, just to give you an idea. Uh, first, we established that fasting is a spiritual discipline that, uh, according to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, is one that we should be doing because it helps keep our hearts focused on the things of God. Next, we saw how fasting uh, really can help us prepare for the work that lies before us and that was demonstrated to us um, through the examples of the apostles in Acts as they did the work of the early church. And, and then we look back into the Old Testament and the people of Israel during the days of the prophet Isaiah to learn that when we fast in the manner God chooses, he opens the door to blessings. And so this brings us forward to tonight. One week from tonight, and this is just unbelievable to me, but one week from tonight is Ash Wednesday which marks the beginning of the holy season of Lent, which is the, the season that we use as spiritual preparation for celebrating Easter. Now, Lent has long been a 40-day period of fasting, just like he, Jesus did in the wilderness. We're going to hear about it in tonight's scripture passage. But we're all reminded throughout Lent of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel message. Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. So the spiritual disciplines of prayer and fasting help reveal to us the sin and brokenness in our lives so that we will repent as forgiveness and find freedom. So here now these words from Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. This is traditionally a lectionary passage that kicks off um, Lent. It's usually used for Ash Wednesday services. I think Dan might even be planning to use it next week. But this is uh, following Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River. Jesus returned from the Jordan River, full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and afterward, Jesus was starving. The devil said to him, Since you are God's son, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus replied, It's written, People won't live only by bread. Next, the devil led him to a high place and showed him in a single instant all the kingdoms of the world. The devil said, I will give you this whole domain and the glory of all these kingdoms. It's been entrusted to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. Therefore, if you will worship me, it will all be yours. Mm -hmm. Jesus answered, it's written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil brought him into Jerusalem and stood him at the highest point of the he said to him, Since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. For it's written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. Jesus answered, It's been said, Don't test the Lord your God. After finishing every temptation, the devil departed from him until the next Opportunity. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue as he normally did and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the synagogue assistant, and sat down. Every eye in the synagogue was fixed on him. He began to explain to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled, just as you heard it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you were here, you might remember a few weeks ago I mentioned the unified theory of Crete. Who remembers the unified theory of Crete? There are probably a couple of ways you could look at this theory. First, things just creep up on us. Like the fact that Lenora and I have been married 14 years yesterday when it seems like just a few years ago we were on our honeymoon together. And then there's also the times that things just kind of creep into times and places that they maybe don't belong. Like Black Friday sales in stores on Thanksgiving. Here is a real life Lenten example of what I mean by this unified theory of creep. And it's shared by someone who also reads the sports column that I regularly read. He wrote into the, the, uh, the journalist of the column. In late January, I passed a bakery that had signs advertising, Get your hot cross buns now. Now, hot cross buns are traditionally eaten on Good Friday and contain ingredients given up for Lent. This year, Lent begins on February 10th, and Good Friday falls on March 25th. So not only was the bakery chain selling a perishable product more than two months prior to the traditional day of consumption, they were selling a product that represents celebratory indulgence following self-denial before the self-denial has occurred. Sound evidence, indeed, proving the merits of this very scientific theory, right? I love this example, and it will likely be something I use again and again during Lent. But if our fasting is supposed to be modeled after Jesus' 40 days in the desert that we just read about, then shouldn't it be a little more, I don't know, difficult or challenging than hot cross buns in January? Now the truth is, when I knew I was going to be fasting for as long as Lenora was telling me, I told her, I'm getting as much out of my system, well, maybe as much into my system, as I can before I'm no longer allowed to eat the foods I really, really love. It, it was gluttonous indulgent in a seven deadly sins kind of way. Uh, I ate with reckless abandon. Especially when we visited my dad and stepmom, who my stepmom is my favorite cook in the world. I, I can still taste the sausage cheese dip. <laughs> I digress. Um, but I, I read this story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness as he fasted for 40 days, and I see what fasting really means and what it requires. Submission, discipline, resolve. It, it means that we must stand up to physical, relational, and psychological temptation. By the way, did you catch what it says in, in verse 13? A after finishing every temptation, the devil departed from him until the next opportunity. Now, I read that and I wonder, does it mean... Every temptation, as in each of the three temptations to which Jesus was subjected to by the devil? Or could it mean every temptation, as in literally every temptation we, in the brokenness of our human condition, are subjected to in the course of our everyday living? Can you imagine the Son of God enduring every single human temptation over the span of 40 days as a means of preparing Him for ministry? Giving Him firsthand knowledge of just how messed up we are. Right? After all, that was the point of Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. The first verse tells us that after His baptism, Jesus returned from the Jordan River full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for this season of preparation. So what must it have been like for Jesus? I love Ashley's thoughts on this. 
knowledge. She writes, when we think of this passage, we often see Jesus standing strong in the face of temptation and think that he was tempted at his weakest moment. But I would offer that I think that during his time of prolonged fasting, he was at his strongest. You see, fasting creates clarity, defines priorities, and builds resolve. One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. Self-control is strengthened through the refining process of fasting. In this sense, it's not just about food. Food is generally the object of our fast, but it is not the focus. The focus is a life united with Christ. Now, for Jesus, his focus was a life united with his Father in heaven. And it was so important for Jesus because we read in verse 14 about how the fasting had prepared Jesus for what God had sent him to earth to do. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. This is after the fast was over. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. You see, before we do anything, any holy acts, any Christian service, any spiritual discipline, we must come face to face with the reality of our identity, with the reality of who we are. For Jesus, he had heard God announce at his baptism back in chapter 3, you are my son whom I dearly love, and you I find happiness. We know too that we, every last one of us in this room, all y'all, are God's children, beloved, and worth worthy of Christ's sacrifice for us. But we also know that as humans we are weak and vulnerable and often resistant to discipline. So these are things that we hold in intention when we fast. In fact, the first temptation that Jesus faced preyed upon his physical weakness. The text says Jesus was starving. So the offer that the devil makes is a good one. Since you are God's son, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Now, the, what, see what the devil does there? He affirms Jesus' identity as the son of God. So turning stone into bread was not outside the realm of possibility for Jesus. He had the power to do it. And the fast was drawing to a close, so why not? Now, Henry Nowen called this the temptation to be relevant. The temptation to be relevant. See, Jesus had the power to meet this current need. But doing so would have been taking a shortcut. It would have been an exploitation of the power that God had given Jesus. So Jesus prevails by reminding the devil that people won't live only by bread which is an allusion to the Israelites and their 40 years in the wilderness when they wandered and relied upon manna from heaven that God provided. Now the second, the second temptation was one that now I call the temptation to be popular. The ways of the world were at the devil's fingertips. He was the one who could make the world stand up and take notice. So he offered Jesus dominion and glory over all the kingdoms of the world. But Jesus knew his path would be the way of a selfless servant. Thus his response reorients the devil to the truth that we are to worship the Lord our God and serve only him. So next the devil tries to play it smart with the ter third temptation by using the words of scripture against Jesus, much of the way, the same way that the scribes and, and Pharisees would do later. He references Psalm 91, a passage that's about trust in God. Trust that God will do what he says. He says, since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. Remember, he's at a high point in Jerusalem. Throw yourself down from here, for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on the stone. You know, I was reminded of the hymn on Eagle's Wings. If you 
you've heard that one. That's one of my favorites because it was my mom's favorite. But there's a verse in that hymn that sings, For to his angels he's given a command to guard you in all of your ways. Upon their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. So if Jesus had thrown himself, the idea is that they would lift him up. Now, now I call this the temptation to be spectacular. Jesus responds, however, by underscoring that the devil's ploy is not about trust in God at all. It's actually about doubt. It's about doubt. Don't test the Lord your God. So we doubt we might be tempted to test him. Okay. You said he would bear me up. Here I go. See the difference. So Jesus resisted the temptation to be relevant, popular, and spectacular through the strength of the Holy Spirit and the power of God's Word. And we too can cultivate that same strength and power through the practice of prayer and fasting, means of grace. As we enter into the season of Lent, I wanted to share a few ideas that might help if you think you want to practice the spiritual discipline of fasting. Now, you could always go the traditional route, especially if you were raised Catholic or no Catholics and give up something for Lent. Find something to give up for the duration of Lent, something that is more indulgent for you than is required for basic sustenance, something that would really challenge you to go without for 40 days. Maybe something like Starbucks coffee. Or coffee altogether. That's just crazy talk. Um, although I've given up coffee. Chocolate. You know, for some, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> some that would be tough. Alcohol and things like that. Now, another food fasting idea would be to do what I call the Wesley fast. Remember I've said repeatedly in here that John Wesley fasted Wednesdays and Fridays most of his life. And what he would do was he would fast on Wednesday and Friday by after dinner on Tuesday eating nothing else until dinner on Wednesday. And then after dinner on Thursday eating nothing else until dinner on Friday. So in addition to my ongoing partial fast and the things that Lenora and I have been forced to give up, I am going to do the Wesley fast throughout my day. Now fasting isn't exclusively the denial of food, however. You might also consider fasting from social media or technology usage and the like. Now, I plan to do this too. I'm going to fast entirely from social media, my Twitter and Facebook accounts, for the duration of Lent. And I've done this before. For one, social media occupies more of my time than it probably should, preventing me from being fully present to God, being fully present to the Lord, being fully present to my kids. So throughout Lent, I want to redeem that. I confess, however, that there is a purely selfish motivation as well, because I honestly cannot bear what I have seen in our country's politics, especially because of the divisiveness associated with it all. So being off of social media would be a relief to not see that uh, garbage anymore. If the fast goes well, maybe I will continue through Election Day. Maybe in November on Wednesday at 6.35, you all have to tell me who won. Um, but no matter what you decide for fasting, the point is, throughout Lent, to seek a more meaningful connection with God. Seek a more meaningful connection with God. It isn't about restricting food or use of social media or whatever. What it's really about is opening up our hearts to God's still, steady voice that meets us in our wilderness. It's about what Paul exhorts us to do in Romans chapter 12. It's about presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice in spiritual worship 
for the renewal of our minds so that we might know more clearly the good and acceptable and perfect will of God for our lives. So I'd like to invite us to pray together one last time this prayer on fasting. And may it help us discern Back to pointing back to last week a little bit. May it help us discern what sort of fast God might choose for us throughout the Lenten season. So let us pray. Blessed God, your witness to us in Scripture is filled with allusions to fasting. And I know that this spiritual discipline is closely connected to prayer. I know that fasting is much more than simply abstaining from food for one day or parts of days or on special days. Fasting is an attitude, a discipline of the Spirit. It has to do with my longing to be closer to you. When I am overwhelmed by sorrow because of the hurtfulness of my words and actions, fasting can be the food for my doing. When I have fallen into a pattern of overeating and have harmed my own health because of it, fasting can remind me that food is a gift and my body your temple. When foolish and hurtful desires well up within me, fasting can refocus my energies and my life on what is truly noble. When I have abused your good gifts of any kind, fasting can restore a proper perspective toward your many blessings in my life. When I am struggling in my life of prayer, fasting can draw me closer to you in my efforts to share my deepest longings and my heartfelt desires. When I need to hear your voice, your corrective as well as your comforting words, fasting can open my ears to your still small voice within when in the midst of my blindness you offer me a precious treasure to lift my soul, fasting can open my eyes to perceive your blessed presence in all things. Certainly, it is important for me to fast, as it were, from sin, from pride, vanity, foolishness, and anger. But you also call me to discipline my spirit by self-denial, so that these unholy attitudes and actions cannot take root in my soul. Teach me then, O oh Lord, how to fast in a proper way that will enable your loving spirit to shape and guide my life. Keep my heart and mind focused on you at all times. Remind me that fasting is a means to an end, not an end in itself. Enable me to be attentive to the inward and spiritual gift. Guard me from extremes that drive love out of my efforts to draw closer to you. Empower me to pray much and to translate my self-discipline into acts of kindness and mercy to others. When I fast, O oh Lord, come to me in all the fullness of your love. Change my heart. Clean up my life. Conform me completely to your will and to your way. Make me zealous to glorify you and offer myself up to you anew. For your service and above all else.